Three times Jesus says, your father who sees in secret. This morning I want to preach to you on this simple thought, what's done in secret. And before getting to the text, I want to share with you a personal story in my life that I hope sets the tone for this message. Because this message could be wrongly taken to be kind of heavy, kind of like really in your face. And I don't want that. That's not the purpose of it. But when we start talking about what happens in secret, sometimes it can, you know, we, we can find ourselves in a place where we're dealing with shame and guilt. And that's not the purpose at all. So I want to share with you a story in my life. When I was in my early 20s, um, there was uh, this lady at church that when she used to pray, it did something inside of me where I got angry. Um, every time I heard her voice, it was just something inside me was like, this woman is a fraud. And I really had a terrible attitude towards this woman in our church. This went on for about a year and a half. I found myself criticizing and judging um, her actions in every way. Um, it's as if everything that I could see was in a negative light. The way I thought she talked to other women, the way I thought she talked to her husband, the way I felt she showed disrespect to the church and to the church leaders. And I was just so convinced, like I knew what I, you know, I was right. This woman is a fraud. And the thing that bugged me the most was when she would pray out loud. About a year and a half of my heart kind of having this attitude towards this woman, there came a moment when we were actually, of all things, in a prayer meeting together. And we were praying for somebody else. And I watched this woman break and have sincere compassion. She's weeping as she's praying for somebody else, something totally unrelated to her. And in that moment, God showed me that I didn't really have a clue about this woman. And God reminded me that God's the only one that has the capacity to look at the heart. And in that moment, what I recognized was that my attitude, not only had it been wrong, but the way in which I had judged this sister was a sin. And I share this story because when this happened in my life, I, I remember at first starting to feel ashamed, like, wow, so I've been in sin for a year and a half, and I didn't even know. And then I started thinking, God, why did you use me at all in the last year and a half? Because back in this stage of my Christianity, I pretty much had the idea that if you ever messed up, if you made a single sin, you know, God was going to come down with the hammer. He wouldn't use you. And so I'm like, God, how, why in any way have you used me in the last year and a half? Because I had seen times that God did. And I was reminded that God used me because of God's grace. It wasn't because of my great spiritual strength. It wasn't because of how perfectly I had been a sinless Christian. That really, it was all God's grace and God's mercy. And, and the irony was is that while God, in a way, was reprimanding me for the sin in my life and convicting me of it, he was simultaneously reminding me of his goodness and of his grace. And I remember the feeling of, instead of being ashamed, and instead of feeling defeated, I remember literally feeling like, wow, God, the fact that you would speak to me directly about this thing in my life that needs changed is an evidence of how much you love me. And like, you don't just give up on me and kick me out the door, but you patiently and lovingly speak to me when there is a need for change in my life. I remember feeling that way and being overwhelmed because I, this wasn't some simple, I mean, I did this for a year and a half, folks. This wasn't like, oh, I messed up and 
I'm immediately broken about it. Now, for a year and a half, I lived with this sinful attitude towards a sister in the Lord. And God dealt with me eventually, and I just remember thinking, wow, God, you are good. And I did repent. And I, I learned from that time. And so I will share that story because I wanted to set the stage for what I have to share this morning with you as I preach to you about what's done in your secret life. So, this is a big section of the Sermon on the Mount. If you're not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, it's the largest sermon ever recorded by Jesus. And there are 24 full verses devoted to this one thing. Repeatedly, Jesus says, what you do in secret, your father sees it. Your father is the one who's in secret. And so he sees what you do in secret. And your father who sees in secret is going to reward you. Your father who sees in secret. Your father who sees in secret. And so Jesus is telling us that what happens in our secret life is really, really, really important. You know, the Bible also teaches us that the devil is a liar. The devil wants us to believe the exact opposite of what God has said. The devil wants us to believe that really what determines who we are are the outward things that we do. You know, I go to church. I can pray. I can talk scripture. I can hold my own in theological conversations. I give. I serve. Those are not bad things. But the Bible teaches us those things don't actually determine who we really are as people. And that when God is looking at us to determine who we are, he's looking at what goes on in the secret life. And so there's some things we need to be doing in our own secret life that are really important. And I want to share with you, really from our text, three reasons. Like you have to focus on what's going on in your secret life. Three reasons. I mean, you need to pay attention and you need to work on what's happening in your life when nobody else is around, three reasons you have got to get serious about what's going on in your secret life. So number one, God is primarily concerned with the actions of your secret life. That's the number one reason you need to be focusing on what's happening in secret. This is what God is primarily concerned with. Three times God is referred to as your father who sees what is done in secret. Nothing that we do publicly can tell us as much about who we are as what we do in secret. This is why God's not, he's not really watching what you're doing in public so much as he is watching what you do in secret. And since God is concerned with what you're doing in secret, you need to be concerned (laughs) about what you're doing in secret. Some of the reasons that we tend to sin in the secret place is because there are no social consequences. There are no social judgments when we sin in secret. I could have a secret sinful life that none of you guys know anything about. And the fact that you see me up here on stage preaching could deceive you into believing that I'm a righteous man. When we sin publicly, then there are social consequences. But when we sin privately, there's the feeling of, well, all of you guys don't know. We even kind of justify it, you know, like, well, it's just between me and God. That's actually a problem for you. That's not a good thing. That's what Jesus is teaching here. It's like, yeah, it is between you and God. And it matters because it's between you and God. But what when we sin in secret, there seems to be no real identifiable, at least immediate social ramifications. There's no judgment from our peers. And here's what I want you to hear me out, brothers and sisters. 
Jesus is, is, he takes a lot of time to teach this 2,000 years ago. But we live in an era of time where it is easier than in any time of history to be tempted and to sin in the secret place. So I, I want to be cautious not to be overly graphic this morning, but I want to give an example of what I'm talking about. Um, you rewind before the days of television, certainly before the days of smartphones and all the technology we have, rewind to that period in time. And if a man or a woman wanted to be unfaithful to their spouse, it took some actions. Like, you had to think it out. You had to figure out where you were going to go. You had to strike up an actual relationship with an actual person. And there were a lot of risks involved. It was much more difficult to keep it secret. But now, you can literally... Make wrong decisions and sinful decisions in this area in the privacy of your own home with a door shut on your phone. And so it's easier now in the secret place to find ourselves tempted to sin than ever before. And this is an important thing that we as God's sons and daughters need to come to grips with because according to God... This is where he's watching us, folks. Like, this is where he's really primarily concerned is what we're doing in the secret place. That's where his eyes are. And we are faced with a greater ability to live with secrets than ever before. We are faced with more things that are only known to myself and God. And ultimately, we have to get to the place in our faith where we recognize God is there, God is looking, and even though he might be the last check, the only check, that God is that check and balance in my life that keeps me pure and keeps me holy in the secret place. Number two, second reason that you need to focus on your secret life, according to Jesus, we're going to be rewarded according to the actions of your secret life. Every time in those first 18 verses that Jesus says, your father who sees in secret, here's what he says, your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I want to talk about rewards, and I want to talk about judgments. So first of all, the things that Jesus is referencing here in the text They're actually the good things we should be doing in secret. Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees because they're doing everything they do publicly for the whole world to see. Jesus says, don't pray like them. When they pray, they make sure there's a lot of people around. And they pray like these loud, wordy prayers so that people can hear them. He says, don't do that. No, when you pray, go into the secret place. So here's one of the things that we learned from this is that the secret place is not only a place where we could be tempted to sin, but there needs to be a place where we are intentional about getting away with God and being in the secret place with God. And you're going to find something that when you do that as a discipline in your life, and you hunger for time with God, and you hunger for time in God's Word, and you hunger for this time where you're praying to the Lord in your own private place, you'll find that you are much stronger spiritually in the other secret places of your life where you could be tempted. And Jesus says, you're going to be rewarded. It's going to be good for you if you do what is right in the secret place. Now, Jesus takes 18 verses to say, Three different times, in three different ways, your father sees what you're doing in secret, and he will reward you accordingly. You may not know this, but the very next section of scripture that I'm about to read falls right here. It's connected 
to God rewarding us for what we do in secret. Let's look at the next few uh, five verses, Matthew 9, 6, 19 through 24. So the very last part of 18 finishes with, your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So Jesus finishes up his thought on what we do in secret and being rewarded accordingly with those statements. That's interesting. Jesus says, so if what your eye looks on is good, if your eye looks for, hungers for, thirsts for, searches for what is good and pure, then what you are, your body, what you are as a person, it'll be full of light. But if what your eye searches for and hungers for and thirsts for is darkness, then your whole body will be filled with darkness. You cannot serve two gods. You can only serve one or the other. Now, clearly, this concept of what the eye searches for would apply to, like, sexual immorality, things that we should not be looking at. But notice, Jesus says this. Jesus says, Whatever the eye looks for determines what happens with who you are. Therefore, you cannot serve God in money. Isn't that interesting? He ties money to this concept of what the eye looks for. And so we, we need to understand something, that there's actually a lot of things that we could hunger and thirst for that are wrong. There are a lot of things we can be looking at that are wrong. You'll find it in your secret place when it's just you and there's nobody else around. You're tempted to pick up your phone. You're tempted, people are tempted with different things. It doesn't have to be watching some uh, lewd, crude thing that is sinful. You might find that your struggle is that you constantly want to binge buy stuff with the money that God gave you every time that you get bored. You might find that you just like to pick up that phone and waste the next two hours of your life scrolling, reading meaningless comments. There are different things that all of us are pulled to look at. There are different things that all of us are pulled to think, well, this will satisfy me. And here's what Jesus says. You, you cannot serve God in anything else. You just can't. It doesn't work. And we see that the, the gaze of the heart, that which matters most to us, tends to be what our heart wants to look at when nobody else is looking, and I'm in the secret place. And so I have to recognize God's He's going to reward me or judge me accordingly to what happens in the secret place. I want to take a, put a little comma right here in this sermon. I'm going to come back to the secret place, but I want to talk about rewards for just a moment. This is so important. Jesus speaks of being rewarded, and I quote, in heaven. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. This is so important. That we understand that our ultimate reward, the ultimate goal that is supposed to 
cause us to want to live holy is the reward and the rewards, plural, that we will receive in heaven. When you study Christianity, that was always the driving motivation, the, the, the most significant reward that should motivate us to be faithful to God is the reward that is coming to us when we leave this cursed world and enter into heaven. God has not promised that if I'm faithful to him, that I'm not going to suffer, that nothing's going to go wrong. God has not promised that if I tithe, I'm going to be wealthy. God has not promised that if I live holy and righteous, I'm never going to get sick and I'm not going to die. God has not promised these things. In fact, you could argue that a lot of these things the Bible teaches will happen to those that truly follow the Lord, that persecution comes to those who live righteously. So I, as Christians, we've got to keep our focus on the real reward that is ahead of us, and we've got to stay faithful to God because there's an actual heaven to gain and an actual hell to shun, and I have to be focused on the reality that the reward that is ahead of me is so great that there is nothing that I could suffer in this world that would be worth giving up that reward. Now, I also want to acknowledge that when we're faithful to God and when we do things God's way, it does benefit us in this world. It's just not in earthly ways that we would always anticipate. You're going to find that the man or the woman that's very faithful in the secret place, they tend to have better marriages. They tend to walk with greater joy. You're going to find that when you're faithful to God, walking with the sense of great confidence that I'm where God wants me to be and 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 just walking with that sense of confidence that it impacts everything about your Christian life. And there are actual benefits, there are rewards, there are blessings in this life to being obedient to God, but those blessings are not necessarily earthly wealth, and those blessings are so insignificant compared to the blessing of heaven which is ahead that when Jesus starts talking about rewards, he just skips over those all entirely together, doesn't even mention it, and is like, no, you're storing up for yourselves rewards in heaven. So back to why then do I need to be careful and pay attention to my personal, my private life, my secret life. Number two, I need to because I'm going to be rewarded accordingly to that. Number three this morning. Third reason that you must care about your private life is because who you are in secret is who God says you really are. So God says there's two sides of really, or two areas of every human being. There's who you are in public, and there's who you are when you're all alone, and it's just you, and it's just God. And God says, when I'm looking, and I'm waiting to, you know, when I'm looking to make a decision on who you are, and I'm looking to make a decision on how you get rewarded, what I'm looking at is not the public you, I'm looking at the secret you. So God says, no, that's who you really are, and that's who's going to be judged. So if God says who I am in secret is who I really am, God's right. That's who I am. I need to understand that and I recognize it is a must then that I work on who I am in my secret life. Jesus tells us our secret life matters profoundly to our whole profession of Christianity. Now, This does not mean that if you're failing in your secret life, that you're a terrible person, that you're not even saved, that you're not a Christian at all. No, if you're failing this morning in your Christian life, here's what it means. You're not as far along in your faith as you need to be. 
it means that there's some things in your life you need to start working on immediately. It means that if you, you're, you're here this morning, if you're a saved Christian, here's what it means. If, you, if you're a saved Christian struggling in your private life, here's what it means. It means you need to get a little bit more serious about paying attention to that area of your life. But, but don't, don't think, well, so if God sees what goes on in my secret life, and in my secret life I'm really failing, then God must see me as a complete failure and a fraud. No, not necessarily. And so I, w- I want you to, if you're trying to figure out, am I, am I just failing or am I a fraud? I'm going to give you some tips to know how you can know. Are you just failing or are you actually just a full-blown fraud? Here's how you can know. So the Bible teaches us that God is concerned about your secret life. Yes? So if God is concerned about your secret life, here's what that means. The Holy Spirit is concerned about your secret life. And so if you're truly saved and you're struggling in your secret life, here's what you can know. The Holy Spirit is dealing with you and convicting you about your secret life. And when you do fail, you will find there's a real sense of, I need to get this fixed in my life. And maybe you're struggling with that, and maybe you don't know how to get it fixed, and maybe you need some help with that. But if you're truly saved, what you're going to find is that the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. And so for the Christian who's struggling in their secret life, here's the reality. You deal with guilt, you deal with remorse, you deal with shame. There's this kind of constant conversation you're having with yourself, like, why do I do that? Deep inside, you don't want to do that. But you find when you're in weakness and when you're in the secret place and when you're all alone, you tend to continue to fail in the same area. But there's this brokenness about it. There's this sense of, this isn't right, and I need to change. If that's you, you are right. There are some things that need to change in your life. But don't be mistaken into thinking, well, I'm a fraud. Because somebody that's a fraud has no remorse whatsoever for what they're doing in their secret life. They don't care. They like it. They want to participate in it. And they just don't want all of us to know so that we don't judge them because they want us to think a certain way about them. And if that's you, I mean, if you've got a secret life that is full of sin and you don't care and it doesn't bother you at all, yes, you are a fraud. You're probably not saved Because the Holy Spirit is not convicting you of sin in your life. But, if you are saved, here's what you know. God's concerned about your secret life. Therefore, the Holy Spirit's concerned about your secret life. And therefore, the Holy Spirit deals with you in your secret life. And so, if that's you this morning, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be encouraged and remember. I want to go all the way back to where I started with my story in the beginning. Like, God does not confront us, folks, because he wants us to feel small and stupid. God's not trying to shame anybody this morning. God wants us to realize, though, that what we do in secret is one of the most important pieces of our spiritual life because it really tells the true story about my commitment to God. It's in that place where it is nothing but me and God, where we find out how important God really is to me. I mean, if the only reason I don't do this sinful thing is because I don't want you to know and I don't want you to know, then really what you think about me is more important than what God thinks about me. And so God says, really what matters to me most, son, what matters to me most, daughter, is that when it's just you and it's just me, that you care so much about me that you make the right decision and that you do the right things for no other reason than you love me and you know that I'm watching and you want to please me as a son or daughter. God says that's what I'm looking for and that's why the secret place is so important to God. The last thing I want to share with you this morning is this thought on like, so You know, our initial instinct 
when, when it's like, oh, man, God's looking at me on the secret place, and now I feel ashamed, and I'm in trouble. Would you stop for a moment and just consider this? How much must God care about you to be interested in what you're doing in secret? He's not looking simply for dirt, right? I mean, he's looking for people that are praying in secret, too. He's looking for people that are fasting in secret. He's looking for people that are helping and serve and giving in secret. God's looking at what we do in secret because it really tells us who we really are, and it demonstrates our love for him. But the fact that he's actually looking at you, that he cares about you when nobody else knows, when nobody else would care, when nobody else is interested, God is. And you know, when we can learn to see it that way, it changes the way I look. It's not like, oh, God's invading my privacy. I can't do anything without God knowing about it. Well, don't have that attitude about it. How about instead, I can't do anything that God doesn't care about. How about instead there's nowhere in my life and there's not a time in my life that God doesn't love me so much that he's not concerned about what I'm doing. That's awesome. It's all about perspective. And so I don't want to feel beat up. I don't want to feel discouraged. I don't want to, I I, I want to know that, wow, God, you love me enough to talk to me about these things and to care about these things in my life. I'm going to ask our worship team if you guys We'll go ahead and get in place this morning. At the end of the day, your faith, it has to be between you and God. It has to grow to the place that when there is nobody but you and God there, you're faithful for no other reason than you love God and you know that God loves you. You know that he's watching and it matters. You know, when you read Matthew chapter 6 in context, the passage is not about being sinless. It's not about being perfect. But it does teach us that the real Christian will desire to be perfect, will desire to be sinless, that the gaze of our heart, the things that we look upon, that it'll cause us to desire to be holy. And that if we don't desire this holiness, if we don't work to be pure in in the secret areas of our lives, then something's really wrong inside of here. This morning, I want to encourage you to get serious about what's going on in your secret life. 